Good morning and welcome to Sunday School. Last week, if you remember, uh, we began a new section in the Book of Romans. Uh, it's a very practical session. section. It is about how I can live a Christian life in a messed up world. And that's a question we're going to be asking through this entire section in the Book of Romans. Um, so I would invite your, you to get your Bible, uh, turn to the 12th chapter. We're going to do our best to finish up the 12th chapter this morning. And uh, as you do that, let me go ahead and lead us in a word of prayer. <clears throat> Lord, we do come to you this morning. We thank you and praise you that you are here with us today. Lord, we thank you for our fathers that are here today on this Father's Day. We, we thank you for the opportunity that, that we as dads have to be able to, to be a part of a family that you've put together with us. Lord, I pray that you will bless uh, every dad today. Be with us this morning as we study your word. Um, help us to, to understand uh, the things that are here before us. Uh, help us to, to apply them to our lives and help us to grow closer to you. Help us to be able to be that person that lives, truly lives, a Christian life in our world today. Lord, we'll just give you the honor and the glory and the praise in all this. These things we pray in your name. Amen. And I do want to say Happy Father's Day to all of you out there today. Um, as we said last week, we, we began this practical uh, section of the book of Romans uh, and that very important question, how to live a Christian life in a messed up world. Last week we saw when we only covered two verses, we saw that the first thing that we must do uh, as a child of God is to offer our bodies, our physical beings, as a living sacrifice to God. You see, I am a, a spiritual being. I am a child of God. But I live in a physical world, and I have a physical body. And, uh, and in light of the fact that in this physical body, God withholds from me uh, the punishment, the things that I deserve from the world. Uh, in light of that, that's called God's mercy, um, I should offer my physical being to God to let him use it as he sees fit, which means he calls all the shots of my physical life and my physical being. Now, that's what we talked about last week. And if I do that, and that is, that is the basic essential thing you must do in order to live a, a Christian life in this world. And if I do that, what can I expect God to do with me? That's what we're going to be looking at from here on out, okay? So let's go to the 12th chapter of Romans, and let me read verses 3 through 8 with you. He says, For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourselves more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourselves with sober judgment, in accordance with the measure of faith God has given you. Just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not have the same function, so in Christ we who are many form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given us. If a man's gift is prophesying, let him use it in proportion to his faith. If it is serving, let him serve. If it is teaching, let him teach. If it is encouraging, let him encourage. If it is contributing to the needs of others, let him give generously. If it is leadership, let him govern diligently. If it is showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully. All right. <clears throat> what could I expect, what should I expect God to do with me if and when I give myself as a living sacrifice to him. Well, Paul starts this off with a warning. And it's not necessarily the warning that I might expect. Because you see, giving myself physically, giving control of myself physically to God is somewhat scary in a lot of ways. Because I wonder, what if God asked me to do something that's really hard? What if God asked me to do something like uh, like going to deepest, darkest Africa as a missionary? 
Or what if God asked me to, to give up all my worldly possessions and live as a pauper and go off and be a, a monk someplace? What if God asked me to, to give up all the physical blessings that I've enjoyed? You know, we, we think about those things. Satan makes us think about those things when we think about uh, giving ourselves up to God. And so that's the things that I worry about. But notice, that's not the kind of warning that Paul says. In fact, what Paul says is, be careful that you don't think about yourself or think of yourself too highly. In other words, he basically says, you need to get your self-esteem under control. Now, that may sound like kind of a strange warning, but let me, let me put it in this sort of a situation. Suppose, or, you know, what, what would you expect if you got that kind of a warning in the first discussion? What kind of things would you expect to be coming? You know, suppose that, uh, that at work tomorrow, your boss calls you into the office. And you go in there and you're all worried. Oh, no, what's he going to do? What's he going to complain about? And he comes in and he says, he says, come on in, have a seat. He, and, and he starts off with words kind of like this. Now, I don't want you to let this go to your head, but I got to tell you something. Well, if you get that kind of a warning, what are you expecting? You know, if you get that kind of a thing, you're expecting him to give you some compliments to tell you something good. Well, that's exactly what Paul's doing. Paul is saying that, that he wants you to keep your self-esteem under control because he's got some things to tell you that are kind of like bragging on you, kind of like telling you some good stuff here. And so that's the warning, not a warning of, of be careful what God's going to ask you to do, but a warning of, of keep your head, you know? Don't get the big head in this situation. So what's he tell you? Well, you notice he, he, when he says that, he, he starts with this illustration about, uh, about the parts of a body. And what he's basically saying in all that is this. You, you are a very important, essential part of God's work in this world. Okay? You're important. God has has a job and a function for you to do. And, and he needs you to do that here in this world. For his work to succeed, he needs you. You are necessary. You know, we've, we've gone through all this uh, coronavirus stuff and finding out uh, what jobs are essential and what jobs aren't to some degree. Guess what? You are an essential part of God's work um, in, in this world. And he likens it to a body. And we have all these different parts of a body. And, and it takes hands, and it takes arms, and it takes uh, head, and it takes ears, and it takes a tongue, and it takes feet, and it takes all these different things to be able to put a body together. Now, uh, that body works in tandem with, with one another. Everything works together to, to function and to do the things that it needs to do. Now suppose someone were to lose a hand. Does that mean the body can't function? Well, of course not. The body still will function. It will still be able to do um, most of what it needs to be able to do, if not everything it needs to be able to do, but it won't be able to do it as well. It's what we would call handicapped. Now, you are an essential part like a hand. You are an essential part of God's work. If you choose not to do your job, God's work can still function. God's not going to quit working in this world just because you decide not to do what you should be doing. But God's work will be functioning handicapped because you're not doing it. Um, now, you say, but, but I'm not sure I can do what God wants me to do. Well, the good part about this is that you don't do your job strictly on your own. God gives you the strength and the power and the ability, and that word ability is, is very important there, to do the job that he has chosen for you. Because those spiritual abilities that God gives you are things we call spiritual gifts. Everyone's call is a little bit different. Everyone's gift is a little bit different. 
the things God has planned for you, he has planned specifically for you, not for me, not for someone else in our church. God has specific things planned for you. Paul here gives a list of seven spiritual gifts. Now, this is not an all-inclusive list. Uh, I'm sure that there are other gifts. In fact, there are other places Paul lists gifts and uh, other than these. But, um, uh, but I believe that these gifts are a broad group of seven that, uh, that are to some degree motivations for how God motivates us to minister to other people. Uh, and so I believe that every Christian has one of these seven gifts listed here. That may not be your only gift. You may use it in a different way than someone else uses that same gift because God has specific individual things for you. But he motivates you through these seven gifts. And so let's, let's look at what those are. Those are prophecy, serving, teaching, encouraging, uh, or sometimes that's called exhortation, giving, leadership, and mercy. Now, like I say, not an exhaustive list, but I believe that every Christian has one of these. You know, one of our fears when I surrender um, everything to God, when I say, okay, God, you tell me what to do, and whatever it is, I'll do it to my, the best of my ability. When we come to that point, one of our fears is that he'll want me to do something that I can't do, or that, uh, that I'm not equipped for, or that I won't like doing, that I won't enjoy doing. But the truth is, and what Paul says here is, that when God picks us for a job, he first of all equips us. And then I believe what he does here is that he motivates us. Uh, he allows us, using these gifts, to see things that are needed in our world, in our church, in our Christian family, differently than someone else sees it. He equips me with the tools that I need to be able to minister in that area and in that situation so that I can successfully complete that. And let me tell you, there is nothing more rewarding than knowing that God has worked through you to accomplish something spiritual and other people. Um, and so God sets things before us and he helps us do them. So how do I live a Christian life in a messed up world? Well, the first thing is I have to give my life sacrificially to God. And the second thing is I have to use the gifts that God has given me to minister to others. Now let's go on to verses 9 through 16. Paul says, love must be sincere. Hate what is evil, cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor, serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with God people who are in need. Uh, share with God's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Now, what Paul has done here is given us seven things, kind of in a rapid-fire setting, uh, that are things that I need to keep in mind because they are things that can be pitfalls, that can be places that I can trip up. There are seven things that every Christian needs to keep in mind and every Christian needs to work on. But you notice there were seven gifts and now there are seven things that he's giving us, seven verses here that we've looked at, and they parallel one another uh, so that the, the first gift and the first thing that he mentions kind of go together. Now they're for everyone, but what you will notice is that one of these is going to be something that is easy for you to trip up on. 
or something that you feel like, man, that's, that's really what I have to focus on. That's really what I have to do. There's going to be one of these that's going to hit you right between the eyes. Now, we could spend a lot of time focusing on trying to figure out what these gifts are and which gift you have. But what I suggest is this. As we look at these, these seven things today, if there's one of these that stands out to you as something that's very important to you, that probably helps you determine which gift is yours. That probably corresponds with a particular gift. So let's look at these as they parallel. The first verse there that we looked at, verse 9, says, Love must be sincere, hate what is evil, cling to what is good. You know, when, when God's people are looking at the sin in other people's lives, and are trying to help people fix things in their lives and correct things. And, and that's people can come up, can, can feel like that we are hard and that we are hard hearted and that we just demand perfection. And, uh, and so he starts off by saying, Love must be sincere. Our ministry to people isn't just to fix things, it's to love them. And my love needs to be sincere. Uh, I need to truly be loving people. Uh, it's easy to be hard on them. Notice it says that I need to hate evil. Do you know that the Bible tells you to hate things? Do you realize that? The Bible says to hate evil. Now, notice it doesn't say hate the people who do evil. It says hate the evil that they do. We're supposed to love. That's love is sincere, must be sincere. So we're supposed to love the people, but hate the evil that is destroying them. So we... We uh, hate the evil, but it also says something else because it's also very easy sometimes when we're looking at, at these things. We're so focused on the bad things and trying to fix the bad things that we miss out on the good. So it says cling to the good. Now those things kind of go with the prophet because that's something the prophet really has to do, has to have. Uh, the next one, the next verse there, uh, verse 10, be devoted to one another in brotherly love honor one another above yourselves you know uh, i need to be devoted to people and i need to honor others you know there are some people that it is you know, they, they work so hard they, they seem like that they're always there helping somebody and it's very easy for them to go home and feel small and left out and unappreciated and unnoticed you know uh, I, I need to focus on the fact that it's not about me it's not about how I feel. I need to be devoted to people, and I need to honor them even above myself. I need to be focused on the ministry to them, not on how I feel. The third verse there, verse 11, says, Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor, serving the Lord. <clears throat> this one is the one that hits me between the eyes. I'm a teacher. That's the gift that I believe God's given me. And, uh, and it says, never lack zeal, and it says to keep your spiritual fervor as you're serving the Lord. You know, uh, you, you've all heard me preach, and something that I have to constantly be aware of um, is that my preaching is very much a teaching style, and, uh, and so sometimes it misses the emotion that needs to be there. You know, I'm not the kind of a guy that's going to pound the pulpit or going to get up and, and shout and scream at you or jump up and down. You know, those things don't happen with me. And so I have to constantly be aware of putting some emotion into what I do. Otherwise, you know what? The teaching comes out as being a bunch of facts that ends up um, easily being dull and boring. You know, so I have to keep that, that uh, zeal and that spiritual fervor. Uh, the, the fourth one there, um, let's see, verse 12 says, Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Those people who encourage other people. In fact, all of us need to do this, but uh, as you're encouraging someone, what do you need to do? You need to be joyful in your own spirit in order to, get, to give them joy. Uh, you need to, to have hope and always have hope so that you can pass on hope to them. You need to be patient with people who are going through hard times. And you constantly need to be in prayer. You need to be faithful in prayer uh, as you are an encourager doing those things. Uh, the next one uh, talks about um, uh, 
uh, giving. Verse 13, I believe. Yeah, share with God's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. I need to share the physical things that I have with people who need it, including sharing myself and including sharing my own home and the things that I have. Uh, the next one uh, talks about um, uh, bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Um, this one is, is interesting, I think, in, in light of some of the things that we have seen recently. I want you to think about this real quickly. Who do you bless and who curses you? And, uh, and who do people curse? You know, if you think about it, um, when we had this situation with, with George Floyd, with uh, the, the killing, the murder of this, this man, um, people are quick to curse the man in the uniform. And in this case, you know, what he did was, was very much wrong and it was very much murder. Um, and, uh, and they're quick to curse that. Notice they did not curse the man or the person who was taking the video with a cell phone. They didn't curse the other people that were around there, uh, but they did curse the ones in the uniform. You know why? Because they have authority. People get angry at someone who has authority over them, and they will curse at those people. And if you're the one with the authority, don't curse them back. Bless them. Your job in, in that leadership position is to bless other people, not to curse them, not to cause them problems. And that's what you're supposed to do. Um, bless those who curse you. And the last one uh, that we have there is rejoice with those who rejoice, mourn with those who mourn, live in harmony uh, with one another. Do not be proud. Um, do not be proud. Uh, where am I? But be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. So I need to live in harmony. Uh, I need to be proud. I need to not be proud or conceited. I need to associate with everybody, with the lower people, with the higher people, with everybody. Um, uh, it's easy to pull away from people, and it's easy to pull people down. I need to live in harmony with people, even with people I don't agree with. Um, instead of proudly forcing my opinion upon them, okay? Um, and then Paul ends up this uh, chapter 12 uh, with, again, with some warnings for everyone. So let me finish up verses 17 through 21. Paul says, Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everybody. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take, take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, It is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. All right? There is, as you minister to people, understand, realize, there is evil out in this world. There is evil out there. And you're going to be confronted with evil. Remember, we are to hate evil, but we're to love the people. So don't repay evil with evil. You know, that's the kind of thing that has taken place at times when, um, you know, when someone gets angry at the situation and so they repay it by doing damage, by, um, by tearing things up. That's repaying evil with evil. Most people are not doing that, but there are some that do. Um, I need to do, notice this is an interesting statement, I need to be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everybody. Um, you need to do what other people see as right. Now, what that does not say is, if someone else thinks it's all right to do something, you should do it. It doesn't say that. What it says is that even if you disagree with me, 
and we get in an argument about something, my actions, what I do in the situation, you're going to end up saying, well, that's not what I wanted to do. That's not what I like. I didn't that, but I guess he was trying to do the right thing, and he probably did the right thing. I need to do what is right in people's eyes, even when they disagree with it. It's still they recognize that I did what was right. And I need to let God punish people. That is the difference between hating evil and hating people. It's God's job to judge and to determine um, the punishment for people who do evil. And guess what? That will happen. God will take care of those people who continue to do evil, and he, they will receive uh, their reward, their punishment for what they've done. But instead, I should, because I know that God's mercy has kept the punishment from me, I should you know, feed my enemy, give them water. Uh, Paul here quotes Jesus with this. The bottom line here with this, knowing that there's evil out in the world, knowing that I have to minister, guess what? The bottom line is, in order to defeat evil, I do it with good. I can never defeat evil by doing what's evil and doing what's wrong. Okay? So we need to live a life out in this world uh, that is all messed up. We need to live that Christian life. And how are we going to do that? Well, we're going to give ourselves sacrificially to God. We're going to uh, minister to other people using the gifts that God has given us. And we're going to be aware of these pitfalls that we could fall into. And we're going to confront evil by doing good. Let me close with a word of prayer. Lord, I do thank you this morning that you've shown us how we're supposed to live. Lord, there's so much more we got to look at and we got to do, but, uh, but I thank you for the lesson this morning. Lord, I, I pray that people will recognize the gifts that you've given them and that even if they aren't sure what that gift is, they will recognize that it's important to them and important to you to do the ministry that you've called them to do. Pray that we will recognize that you never call us to do something that you don't equip us for. Help us to be your people in this world and help us to make a difference. Lord, I also pray about the, the situation with all this coronavirus. Uh, the numbers are going up, not down. Uh, Lord, I pray that we will do what we need to do to be able to keep this under control, to be able to save people's lives. Lord, just help us to be that kind of people. We'll just give you the praise and the glory for all that you do. These things I pray in your name. Amen. <laughs>